Welcome to Talking Giants, the number two podcast in the Dominican Republic, presented by DraftKings. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Panic. Uh, hope it's a shorter episode. We got oh. an interview with JT Alphabet, who is a trainer with Darius Slayton, Evan Ingram, Aziz Ojolari, uh, Andrew Thomas, and Tay Crowder. All Georgia Bulldogs that you just named? Evan Ingram and Darius Slayton aren't. Ingram, well, you know what? No. I'm, I'm not going to spoil the interview of how, how they all got together. Ingram's sister was a Georgia Bulldog. That's why I got confused. That's true. That is true. All SEC guys, at least that. Um, so we got an interview with him, that, uh, a, sh- a short little interview with him at the end of the episode. Um, and before that, we're going to talk about the outside linebacker group. Not like necessarily giving our takes, but just making the case for and against each player um, and why they should should or shouldn't be. Um, and that, and that top two outside linebacker, uh, rotation, Justin, how are you? Hey, Bobby Skinner. Um, we keep on getting comments that, um, we, we, uh, we spend too much time not talking about the giants. Uh, there was a a nice, uh, this person probably really enjoys us, but, um, there was a person on our last episode that, uh, that left a YouTube comment that left the timestamp of when we actually started talking about the giants. Um, it was about five minutes in, so I'm not going to really express how I am or how I'm doing. Because we just need to start talking about the Giants right now. How and how, how are you? I guess because nobody really cares about that. Relax. For, <laughs> uh, for first of all, uh, I, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you know, I just I'm a fan of. Uh, all right, we're gonna we'll yeah. talk about we'll talk about some stuff at the end of the podcast. You're a fan of Dwayne Haskins. Yes, yeah, big time fan. Um, all right, all right. Let's let's. Uh, I really Let, did get triggered. I really did get triggered. I apologize to that person. That oh left yeah. That, oh that no. That, that yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Don't get a little little triggered. Because that was really that was really directed at them. Uh, so I got it out of the way. I'm good. Let's uh let's talk about the uh let's talk about some edge rushers. Yeah. Let's talk Where about are these some guys edge... going to fit. Let's talk about the edge rushers and then we can uh, we can BS after the interview. Um. So I I want to talk. About, I just one we are looking for topics instead of just like. Do, we'll do, we're going to do one more mailbag before training camp starts, either Tuesday or Friday. But I didn't want to do it this week, you know, just because we kind of just got back. So I didn't want to do a, another mailbag. Um, so I was trying to think of topics. And it's like, okay, let's talk about the outside linebacker group because it is so crowded, but there's really no clear-cut leader in that room. So we'll talk about Lorenzo Carter, Aziz Ojolari, Fetty, uh, Odenabo, and O'Shane Zimenez of why each one of those guys could – um, be like you know the top producer there or why they could be the fourth guy out of that group or you know some of them can even you know fall the fifth if Ellerson Smith produces well you know halfway through the season um, so who do you want to talk about first do you want to go like the projected one or the projected four I want to go projected one who do you think that would be Lorenzo, Lorenzo Carter. Carter there's only there's only one question on why Lorenzo Carter wouldn't be the projected one yeah, so the tor- the the torn Achilles tendon is is like the big question mark with Lorenzo Carter. Uh, will he come back? But the case for him is he's been he was a full participant in you know the the rookie or not rookie camps the the off season activities, which you know there's no really reason to push yourself in those if you're not ready. You know Saquon wasn't even out on the field with those guys. Um, it's a contract year for Lorenzo Carter. You know, as, when I was getting ready for this, I was kind of like, oh yeah, man. It's, it's already year four for Lorenzo Carter, Will Hernandez, B.J. Hill, uh, R.J. McIntosh. It's like, it's wow, okay, we're getting on some some contract years for Dave Gettleman draft picks, and Lorenzo Carter really is in that. And I think he's the guy who could fluctuate the most with with a contract. So he's got that going, uh, what he's playing for. Um, going off of 2020, he looked like a good player. You know, like like before he got injured in those five games, like it was like, okay, Lorenzo Carter's a good player. He's not great. He's not blowing you away, but he's making an impact in every single game. You know, he's not costing you. You know, he's he's a do it all type player, which is you know, which is big for Patrick Graham. We've seen that in the way they uh, you know they draft and sign players, where it's like he can set the edge, he can rush the passer. He's not gonna blow. He's not gonna be you know blow past people and bend the edge like crazy. But he's gonna have some sacks. Had four sacks his rookie year, four and a half his second season, um, and he can drop back in coverage and be functional at doing that. Um, six foot five, two fifty. So he's got experience, you know. Where Aziz, you know, the guy who probably would be next to compete with him is, you know, is a rookie. 
So, yeah, he kind of has, like, everything going for him to be the starter and get the most reps besides coming off the injury. Yeah, I mean, even before the injury, you know, well, obviously after the injury, he got 0% of the snaps. But before the injury, he was getting, like, 80 90% of the snaps in, in games. And, you know, at least in years past now, obviously, you know, Patrick Graham, different defense coordinator. But since the days, you know, we had JPP, Olivier Vernon, and they were getting, you know, 70, 80, 90% of the snaps, and especially the, you know, 2016 year where Spags ran those guys into the ground just because there was no depth. Even with a little bit of depth that the Giants had at the edge rusher spot last year, you know, we were sitting here wondering why Marcus Golden was getting only 30% of the snaps. Well, it's because Lorenzo Carter was getting, he was like the one guy, the outliner, the outlier, who was getting 90, 80% of the snaps. And that's where, you know, partially, I, that's why I think that he kind of stood out a little bit more is because he was on the field. And, you know, when you're out on the field, you're able to stuff the stat sheet a little bit more, but also credit to him that the coaching staff felt like he could be out there first of all. And then also being productive, isn't just, you know, you can't snap your fingers just because you're on the field and be productive in the NFL. He wasn't stuffing the stat sheet in terms of pressures, but just being a complete, like you said, Bobby, a complete and a versatile player. Um, I think he's the best run defender out of all these four guys. Uh, I think he is the best best athlete. I'm putting a question mark, but in, in an asterisk next to the best athlete because what is he? That. What is he going to look like uh, coming back from injury? And even Aziz, if he didn't get hurt, I don't agree with that. Do you think Aziz is a better athlete? Yes. Okay. I, I say best athlete because just we we've seen Lorenzo Carter out on a football out on a professional football field. Um, best in coverage, like I said, he had multiple games of ten plus snaps, dropping back into coverage last year. And he also has, I know we have, you know, the edge room and now the interior linebacker room is a little bit of, is a little bit crowded because of Carter Coughlin, but he also has like that interior linebacker versatility as well, where he can't line up as that, as your, as your full-time interior linebacker, but as just putting him there, whether it's against the run or as a guy that can come in and blitz, he can do it. And, or as a guy that could drop back in coverage, like that's, and that's why I think Patrick Graham, He's going to get the most in this. So here we go. I think he's going to get the most snaps and why he, it would make sense for Lawrence Ricardo to get the most snaps is because he is the most versatile. Patrick Graham can utilize his skill set the most. And he is the most like wild card as to, you don't know what he's going to do. Yeah. He does everything good enough where two of these yeah. guys on this list, they don't do anything of, of one aspect of this game. And that's yeah. dropping back in the coverage. Um, you know, where Aziz is very well rounded too, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about him in a second. But he does everything where, like you said, he can, you know, play the, you know, that will linebacker, which he's done at times, like you said, not not full time playing that position where you can put him there. You could put another edge rusher there. It's like you can just do different type of personnel systems with Lorenzo. Um, and and you always are guessing as an offense on what is he going to do? Is he going to rush the passer? Is he strictly going to be setting the edge versus the run? Um you know, is, is he going to drop back in the coverage? Is he going to stunt? Like, he can do all of all of those things. But, you know, the torn Achilles attendant, that's like a serious injury too, you know? So, like, I, um, like do you think, though, he'll play in preseason games coming off that injury? I, I, I have no clue. You know, and, you know, this is where, you know, even if we did the research of looking up, you know, and maybe I'll – maybe we'll do – maybe I do want to do this for his PPP at least give the give the effort there of like looking up guys that have come off this kind of injury and then what have they, what did they do coming back and you know, how many games did they play and how did they look et cetera et cetera doing because we're not you know, we're not doctors I would hope that he wouldn't play in the preseason that's kind of like my hope because we kind of know what we're gonna get out of Lorenzo Carter at least healthy Lorenzo Carter I kind of would want to see what we can get out of O'Shane, what we can get uh, out of Odenebo, uh, if he is, is Odenebo even like a full-time edge rusher and especially Ellerson Smith, seeing Ellerson Car- Smith. Yeah, Carter there. has a floor that probably nobody else really has. Yeah. You know, like as a do it all, like, you know, Odenebo has a floor, but it's like, he just doesn't drop in the coverage at all. Yeah. Um, so we know what Carter is in a way, you know, obviously we don't know what he looks like coming off the injury, but we know what he is. And I would rather see, some other guys like kind of get out there and you know rock and roll and see what they're about. Next, Aziz Ojulari, Giants second round pick, uh, just turned t- 21, twenty one, six foot three, two hundred forty nine pounds. He had first round buzz. Now I was not part of the first round buzz 
um, crowd with Aziz where I, I felt like I felt he was drafted right around where he should have been drafted, you know? Um, you know, and one of those reasons was, you know, look at him versus Stone Forsyth, who was like a sixth round pick by the Seahawks and, and he had some issues. Um, but that's that being said, he just turned 21, um, had that first round buzz, you know, so a, a better draft prospect than Lorenzo Carter was. Um, bends the edge better than anyone. Like if you if you're if you're saying like just get you know dip around that corner and and bend the edge like I don't th- I'm not going to say it automatically has the best pass rush moves. Um, I think O'Shane might still have that, um, but just bending the edge wise, like Aziz Ojolari is going to do that better um, than it than I think any of these outside linebackers um, with some pass rush moves and like Lorenzo Carter. You know, unlike some, you know, Shane Zimmons, is, who is, is a pretty decent pure pass rusher, he's a do it all type player. Drops back in the covers, looks good in it, plays the run. Now, there's times where he can get pushed off the edge um, a little bit. You know, Lorenzo Carter, you're not going to see that happen, but he still plays the run as, you know, like plays it smart, you know, knows how to spill through pulling guards or, or if he needs to play the outside, to play the outside. Like he knows how to play that position. And he's just so, so young. Seems to be a guy that's like looking to play. And also another thing in his his corner is one, there's a see the second round pick, so there's expectations. Give the young guy some playing time when the rest of this group really hasn't set themselves, you know, head and shoulders ab- uh, above anybody, you know? So it's like like Aziz Ojalar should be getting playing time just for the sake of like, you know what? Why not? Why not give a guy who can do it all? playing time to go out there and learn instead of, you know, maybe putting someone who's, you know, better right away, those more reps. Like Aziz Ojalar is going to get important reps week one. Yeah. He I would get more reps than Kadarius Tony week one. <laughs> I, I would certainly hope so. Cause you know, he, he does have the tools to already be the best pass rusher on this team. Um, has the high, so here are some, you know, the, the notes that I have has the highest ceiling and hopefully a snap share increases as the weeks go on. So even, you know, we're talking about which edge rusher, you know, in terms of the depth chart, right? Which edge rusher is going to get the most snaps and what are the snap shares going to look like, you know, especially to, as the season as the season ends, when the season ends. But I think, it, you know, we may be looking back when the season ends that Aziz Ojolari, weeks one through eight, his snap share looks completely different than weeks eight through 17. Um, so that's something to, or 18, week, 18 weeks, right? So weeks, uh, eight through 18 the second half of the season so um here are some questions that i have though and i i i want to say honestly that there are more questions around you know a rookie and a guy that we haven't you know haven't seen on the football field more than the rest of the guys here is he too raw is he too young does he have enough play strength yet does he have enough pass rushing moves to be successful right away those are like the main questions that i have especially is he too raw and is he too young? Because, but I mean, I can't wrap my head around, you know, I'm 23 years old and I still feel like a child. Um, he's 20 years old, Bobby Skinner. <laughs> he's 20 years now, old, but, but yeah, he's 20 or he's, he's still 21. You know, he just got his freaking license turned the other way. <laughs> yeah. It's, and you look at some all time pass rushers and you look at their, like some of the best pass rushers in the game, you look at their rookie season. It's like, yeah, these guys didn't pop right away. No, you know, like T like TJ Watt, who's like, you know, after Aaron Donald, maybe the best defensive player in the, in the league, you know, he had like, you know, seven sacks his rookie year. Yeah. And so, also, well, in the, and, and, and he's not like, you know, a top 10 pass rusher. Like even yes. look at Chase Young, who we all think is going to be really great. Like he had a good rookie year, but like, what do you have like six and a half seven sacks yeah yeah so uh, that's what i that's what i was exactly going to say is that you know the guys that were drafted high like you know think of the boses of the world the garrets of the world the Big chase Youngs. showed out right away. yeah but, but i mean think of those guys uh, and, and i mean i would say overall you know even though chase young you know, didn't get the seven double and a half for chase young double digit sacks i'm also of the belief that you don't need to be a double digit sack player in the NFL to be a really good pass rusher, you know, because I've talked about this stat on bleeding blue. I've talked about it on here. You know, 1985, there were 30, there were like 30 players that got 10 plus sacks in 1985. In 2020, there were 10 players in the NFL that got 10 plus sacks. So you know, that doesn't mean that there are only 10 good pass rushers in the national football league. That's, that's nonsense. 
But so those guys, though, you know, the Bosa's of the world, the Miles Garrett's of the world, um, Chase Young's of the world, they were drafted high and they started off their careers relatively hot, relatively good because they had that expectation. They were drafted high for a reason. Even if there was a, a, a team that reached on, you know, a, a Rousseau earlier or a Jalen Phillips earlier, you know, these guys just as pass rushing prospects are not even comparable to the Boses of the world, to the Chase Youngs of the world, or the Miles Garrett's of the world. So I am really probably more, more than I should pumping my brakes on my expectations for Aziz Ojolari simply because there are other guys on this football team that have way more experience and Carter's more versatile. I'm Yeah, he shouldn't be expected to come out and ball week one. Yeah. But with that being said, he has the highest ceiling of all these guys, oh, too. Oh, correct. Correct. You know, so them taking like if he's the, not better than like if he's not like a good amount better than what Lorenzo Carter is right now, a year or two in, then it's like it's like a disappointing player. Yeah. And them taking the Lorenzo Carter approach, which they a, a lot, you know, Lorenzo Carter came in on a lot of third downs his rookie year, and then they started to kind of bring him along more and more and more. The Lorenzo Carter approach is what I'm expecting with Aziz Ojolari, even though he kind of has like this first rounder tag on him even though he was taken in the second round so even though he's a more talented player we have more expectations for him year one i'm still expecting the lorenzo carter rookie pace that he got yeah yeah would you week six do you think he they come out for the first play of the game two outside linebackers do you think he's one of them no you don't have to spend too much time on because we're doing our camp battles episode in a week or so too but no okay all right I'll, we'll save our conversation for that for camp battles on July 27th. All right, next on this list, free agent edition, Afedi Odenabo, six foot three, two sixty, twenty seven years old, giant sign on a one year contract. Um, here's something: he's got more sacks than anybody. Like he is, he has more production than any of these guys. He has ten and a half sacks over the last two years. Entered the league in 2018 too, so it's not like he's been here since 2015. Yeah, last two seasons he's had ten and a half sacks. Um, Lorenzo Carter was injured. So, but his first two years, he had eight and a half. Um, and he like has hand in, like, he's the only one with hand, like real hand in the dirt experience. Oh, Shane puts his hand in the ground sometimes. And so does Lorenzo, but like, like he's comfortable with his hand in the dirt. Um, and, and again, production does matter with, with these guys. So if they're like, Hey, like we're, we're trying to get a guy out here who can, you know, get production and play the run. Well, a Fetty can do that. Now I don't think he's the greatest run defender. Um, but when I talk about that, that was more of him like talking, like playing that five tech defensive tackle position, which he can also do though. Like he can play, like you can't pit Lorenzo Carter over a guard. You really can't put his, you know, as, or at least as a hand in the dirt, like you could put him in the gaps, but you can't put Aziz Ojolari like, you know, over a guard and expect him to play no. the run well. Lorenzo no. Carter, you can't do that. Ocean is different. None of the edge guys, you know, if you go down the you list, Ellerson Smith, Ryan Anderson, uh, Cam Brown. He's the only one where, again, we talk about scheme di uh, diverse, you know, like diversity. He can do that where other guys can't. Um, the case against him, though, is he doesn't play in coverage at all. He had like two coverage snaps last year. Yeah. So he, he's kind of – he is – you know, defensive four three defensive end and and three four outside linebacker are like sometimes the same position. Like Mark, like if he if he was asked to play a Marcus Golden role, I don't wouldn't view much of a change. But outside linebacker edge, which he practiced with in the OTAs, is a much different role than hand in the gr uh, ground defensive end. So it's like you know, Patrick Green can put in the coverage in the same ways that he put you know Dexter Lawrence and and B J Hill in coverage every once yeah. in a while. But I don't think like I think he has like the the lowest ceiling as far as actually like playing the flats and stuff like any of these other guys. Yeah. Um like even Ellison Smith who hasn't done it, you can see he has like he looks like a guy who can learn that and get better. He has the that. athletic traits, you know. Here we'll 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 use that phrase. So I just looked up o o Odenabo's size because you know, here we go. Here it's one of those situations where he wore number ninety five and he put his hand on the dirt with Minnesota. So he looks a lot bigger than probably he actually is. And, you know, Mark, so I compared him to Marcus Golden, both were the same number. So I said, why not? And, you know, Odenabo's going to that edge outside role. So I figured it's a fine comparison. Od uh, according to pro football reference, Odenabo is actually two pounds less than uh, Marcus Golden. Um, uh, Marcus Golden is. He must have had a weight when he got on because he looks a lot bigger. 
260 pounds, and then he's listed on Pro Football Reference as 258 pounds. So I thought that there was a major size difference. I thought that maybe that, it I mean, looks maybe, like there is. I mean, that could be his combo. Like he could have gained weight since he got in the league. Yeah. Well, no, he I don't looks think a it's lot a, bigger than Marcus. No, I mean, I think the pro, pro football reference does a very good job with a lot of things they do. And I don't think that they would take a well, three years without updating the players heights and weights. I think it goes but they don't off take the players heights and weights. Like no, when, I'm saying, but it goes off the websites. That's what, that's what they take it off of. So, I mean, the websites, yeah, they like, they like, like selling it. Like Eli Manning got tested for height and weight his rookie year in the combine, and I don't think the NFL ever took his height and weight since. No, but I mean, my, my whole point is is that it's not a stretch to compare them size wise. And my whole thing this whole offseason, when talking about Odenabo as an edge rusher and being a little bit confused by it, is that well, he's not an edge rusher; he's an interior defensive lineman. But my Points that if the size is comparable, if Marcus Golden and Odenable are somewhat of a similar size, then it can make sense. And Golden actually talked about um, 2019 during a Giants huddle interview that he did. I think he did it with Madeline Burke or one of the people with the Giants. He talked about how when he was asked to put his hand on the ground the year after James Betcher left in 20 in 2018, you know, because 2018 Betcher was with the Giants. That was his first year as defense coordinator. He talked about how going from Betcher standing up being a stand up edge rusher to putting his hand back on the ground was, was awful because he got so comfortable as an, as a stand up edge rusher and rushing the passer that way. And I don't know if Odenabo has ever done that in his career. And typically I think when you talk to a lot of players, I think they prefer to not put their hand in the dirt. So maybe he can get a lot more comfortable. Maybe he can you know, be more comfortable rushing the passer this year, you know, from that, you know, outside, you know, wider nine technique rather than just, you know, being inside the tackle and going and going just straight through the tackle. So um, I do think maybe the maybe this could even transition us to our uh, to the next guy. I do give Odenabo the slight edge as a productive and good pass rusher over O'Shane Zimenez. And am I crazy for saying that? No, you're not crazy. I mean, I think it would be it, it's fair. O'Shane Zimenez, six foot four, two hundred fifty-two pounds, twenty-four years old, third-round pick out of Old Dominion. Um, once he, once upon a time, he was, uh, you know, everyone's everyone's guy. Torn rotator cuff, so he basically missed the whole season, not with like a huge injury, you know, like I don't think a torn rotator cuff is as devastating as, you know, Saquon or Lorenzo's injuries, but it's still an injury that he missed the whole year for. Like, they, remember they tried to bring him back and he just didn't. Apparently, he didn't he like. He just wasn't ready, and they just shut him down. Yeah, season. and then they so they so they gave him surgery and yeah, so six months to recover. I tried to briefly look up to see if there's any like lingering effects, but I mean, I again, I, I'm not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. Let's hope that he's ready to rock and roll. But I mean, it, it is the shoulder. I mean, you know, Bobby, how often does he kind of do? I know Odenabo does this a lot, but how often does O'Shane do that move where he kind of he's kind of sticking a tackle with one arm and he's extending. Armbar. Huh? Yeah, he does that a lot. The arm, okay. you know, the arm bar with, you know, he could rips, you know, swim. There, there's a lot of stuff you could do with that. Here's something going for him, Justin. The year three defensive player jump. Oh, it's real. Every, it seems like every year there's like a, this guy who's a rookie last year, he's going to get so much better. And it's like, ah, slow your roll. Like with Lorenzo Card, it's like, slow your roll a little bit. Get on the talks about Lorenzo. that. Um, you know, you know, BJ, you know, uh, not BJ Hill. He hasn't got much playing time. Uh, O'Shane Zimenez was O'Shane Zimenez was the very over like his expectations for last season were very over put I think you know but you know he was my giant factor for week, week one I remember that because it's like all right let's see what you are you're going to get a lot of reps how good of a pass rush you are how, how have you moved from year one to year two um, so that year three player um, jump is but if you go back to his rookie year where he played the full season he had just as many sacks as uh, Lorenzo Carter with four and a half. In fact, he had the second most sacks on the team and he didn't play a lot either. He had 220 less snaps than Lorenzo Carter, you know, um, and, and a lot less than, than Marcus Golden. He had those four and a half sacks. So he's got, he's like, he's a good pure pass rusher. Like he's got real moves. He can inside counter. He knows how to redirect. Um, so like he, he's like a, like, I think he's depending on what Aziz is right away. Like if you just okay, let's just take Aziz off off the roster. He's I think I still think he's the best pure pass rusher on the team, because um, he just like he has a, diver, a diverse you know um, like to, like toolbox um, of of moves to use where a lot of guys don't have that. 
Um, so, and it, like, you, you know, like who wouldn't, who would you rather have on a third and long him or, you know, Cam, you know, if, you know, a Fetty, I, I think I would go O'Shane. Um, so this camp's big for him. Like it don't be surprised if O'Shane shows out this camp and he's like the baller of this camp. He, he basically missed the whole year. So he's been forgotten, but I haven't forgotten O'Shane. I'm not like, I'm not like full bloom in love with O'Shane where it's like, they need to play this guy more. But I also know that like, you know, we talked about it after draft. I was like, don't count this guy out quite yet. Yeah. We've had this conversation before too. And I keep on going back to O'Shane was kind of last on the edge rusher totem pole. I mean, you know, Kyler Fackrell was getting more snaps than O'Shane's Zimenez. And Kyler Fackrell isn't, isn't anything great. And you know, I, I Mark him and Marcus Golden were kind of, uh, I think Golden got a little bit less snaps than him because uh, O'Shane, the, his biggest game was 58% of the snaps against San Fran, but that was kind of a big blowout. 41% against Pittsburgh, 29% against Chicago, and then the Rams game, he got hurt. So I, the reason why O'Shane is down on my totem pole out of these four is because the Giants coaching staff showed that they did not have the, the most confidence in him or in the world in O'Shane last year, especially when you compare him to Kyler Fackrell. I mean, if, if in my opinion, if you're not beating Kyler Fackrell out in snaps, I mean, it's not that you're doing something wrong, but clearly you ain't doing every, everything right. Uh, but he did have sneaky, you know, it was, it was the sneaky production in the 56 pass rush snaps. He had three QB hits and five pressures. And that's according to pro football reference. Um, the 56 pass rush snaps is from PFF, but I don't take PFF pressures. So uh, he had a little bit of sneaky production for the opportunities that he was given. And I am kind of getting in this boat of, I give a little bit more sympathy to especially defensive players when looking at their box score stuff and looking at their advanced stats, I'm giving a little bit more sympathy to guys that don't get a lot of snaps. And if they are productive, I give them more brownie points because you know, it's a dance. It really is a dance. you got to get out there and you got to get a feel for your opponent. You got to get a feel for your partner and, you know, how can you beat this guy? How, how can I beat the guy that's from across from me? And you can't just, you know, snap your fingers and do that from snap one. You kind of have to get your feet wet a little bit. And O'Shane has never been really given the opportunity to get his feet wet against anybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I like O'Shane. I don't love him, but I, I do like him. Um, so do you rank, um, do you rank a Fetty over um, O'Shane? Because they're, I mean, they're basically even for me, but I give Effetti the edge because of the previous players, production. Man, they're different players. Like if you're asking uh, for third and two, I'm probably putting Effetti in. Third and seven, it's O'Shane, no doubt. So yeah. they're just different players, uh, and that's why I think both should make the team. If if you're um, playing, if you're playing, um. But here's the thing: going against O'Shane, if they don't want to keep a you know six guys at that outside linebacker spot. They might be like, all right, O'Shane, we're uh, we're giving that, we're giving a, we're giving Ellison your spot. Yeah, Cam I Brown plays a ton it. of special teams. He yeah, like second on our team in special teams reps. Uh, we got these three guys ahead of you. You're in year three. We didn't draft you. You were drafted for a system where you were basically rushing off the edge every play and not having to have the ability to drop back in the coverage. There's like like O'Shane could get cut. I don't want him to get cut. Um, but there's there's a, w- a world where they're like, hey, we we would rather give those reps to Ellerson Smith. Yeah, I when we did our when we did our very early fifty three man roster I prediction, I actually initially before we eat before I even started to fully put together the roster, I did leave him off, thinking that I was going to have to leave him off, but I I didn't because obviously you know uh, I, I I I cut guys like Nate Ebner and you know cut other special you know cut other special teams guys, but. It would not surprise. I mean, what are what are O'Shane's um, special team snaps? I can, yeah, and I can that's the thing is that. Lorenzo Aziz Effetti. I don't see any of those guys getting cut. O'Shane, it could happen. O'Shane had fifteen. If he gets cut for Ryan Anderson, I'll be pissed. O'Shane basically had fifty eight percent, fifty percent, sixty five percent of the special team snaps. So I mean, he he does play yeah. special teams, but that's he's good. not a special teamer. You know. Yeah. So, but but that's that's good though. If he, if he gets cut for Ryan Anderson, I'll be a little aggravated by that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're not even going to talk about Ryan Anderson. No, 
He's not uh, ranking. And watch him. Four. Watch him just be like the number one guy too. Just to really just throw it right in our face. Yeah. Why not? All right. We spent thirty minutes on this. We're like, this won't take very long at all. Um, I was like, are we even gonna spend twenty minutes on this? We did it. All right. Before we get to the interview, um, Joe Judge did an interview with the Flying Coach podcast, Sean McVay and Peter Schrager. I'll be honest. I was a little let down. This interview. Like the stories that he told for the most part were ones we already heard, like the Nick Saban interview and the Bill, like Bill Belichick. Like I, like we've, at least if you're, you know, those are out there. We, I've heard those, those stories. Um, I did think was cool. Um, Ellis Johnson, who was his coach at, uh, I forget the name of the college. I should have wrote it down. Um, like the Patriots wanted to interview with him, but he's like, no, nah, I just took this, you know, job with them. You know, I want to be loyal. And then he found out about that. And it's like, no, go interview for that. Like, I don't want to stop you, which did remind me of the Brett Bielma situation. You know, there's a lot of guys on this, on this team that could, you know, possibly go, go somewhere else and coach and, and Joe judge wouldn't stop them from doing that. So I, I like that. Um, McVay wanted to talk specifics. Like if you listen to McVay's podcast with with Kyle Shanahan, I mean they're talking specifics, X's and O's. Judge didn't want to do that. Like don't like McVay tried to pull out pull it out of him a couple times, where he mentioned the Tampa game, some stuff in the Tampa game. Well, I mean McVay and Shanahan, they seem like a couple nerds, and that's not and Joe they're Judge. they're friends. Where McVay and Judge didn't know each other previous to this. Yeah, yeah. But McVay was tried to get out of him a little bit. With he mentioned, you know, brought some stuff from the Tampa game. McVay, and then McVay he, and he brought Shanahan. up the Austin Johnson sack. Yes, he did. It, 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 that was funny. And where Joe he, Judge it, didn't bite. The only he he brought up a, f- which I uh, you might think is funny. He brought up, remember the after the third quarter of the 49ers game, fourth and short, we did a QB sneak we didn't get, and yeah, he, he like mentioned like I was probably a little too emotional on that. Yeah, he regretted. And it, then yeah. we didn't go for it on fourth and one like a lot after yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he, he talked about the tempo of the, in terms of uh, some some stuff that I, and by the way, McVeigh and Shanahan probably know each other like the back of their hands. Yeah, so, they're like um, really, they're like, I mean, they've, they've worked together. They're good friends. Yeah. Well, they've worked, and then they also face each other twice a year. So there's nothing that they're going to say to each other that they probably don't already know about each other. So it's not like the state secrets have to be kept there. But um, Judge did talk about, you know, McVeigh asked him, you know, what's, what's one of the things that, you know, looking back on like your rookie year of coaching and, you know, maybe something that you want to change or improve. And he talked about the tempo of the game, you know, keeping with the tempo of the game. He's like, you know, I'm not really involved in the play calling, but um, he didn't talk specifically about the tempo of the game. I guess like timeouts are included in that. I wanted him to talk about fourth down decision making with the tempo of the game. He didn't, but I'm going to infer that that is ultimately part of it. Um, he talked about, he mentioned, this was very brief and I wrote this down. He mentioned explosive plays as a pattern of the going along the process of how he prepares and how he watches tape. They talked a lot about like how you watch tape and what you look for. And what, one of the things that he said is how does an opposing offense produce explosive plays? So, I mean, Hey, small point, but if, if you're asking a coach, how do you go about your process? And that's one of the things that he says, and it pops in his head. Um, I'd like to believe it. And that's actually a legitimate thing that he does. So, and there's, hey. and there's those are things like the pack, the James Bradbury interception versus Washington. Like that was a very well designed defensive play against um, a pretty a common chunk play play by an NFL team where it's 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 um you know you're running dagger where you have the clear out in the slot you have the twenty yard dig and then the other route coming under they covered they showed that they covered it under and made it seem like the dig route was going to be there but James Bradbury took like so that was probably something that you know Scott Turner who you know I actually like Scott Turner's offense a good amount who, you know, is looking to get those chunk plays, like Patrick Graham was probably like, all right, when they get in this formation and this down and distance, they're pro- they're going to come to this dagger play. Um, so stuff like that, like I, I like that's I, that's the nerdy. I was hoping for more nerdy stuff like that, even yeah. though they didn't bring that up. I did that, but still. There you go. There you but go. I was hoping like, like I wanted that. I want them to like talk through plays. Like they didn't even ask about like, and this is part of like, they didn't even ask about like his relationship with Patrick Graham, you know? Yeah, like Patrick Graham didn't even take an interview with the Jets and like in, and re up for the like I would I would ask about that a little bit you know they didn't ask about Garrett at all, which you know I was fine with that. Maybe there was but a specific. It, it was request. just kind of like and and Peter Schrager oversold it and I like Peter Schrager but he's like and he's hilarious. I was like I don't think Joe Judge even tried to be funny in this interview. I, no. Like there was nothing funny about the interview unless you no. really think like him calling a a whiteboard a greaseboard like that funny. 
I mean, I couldn't. Uh, so you've heard some other judge interviews where I, I guess he was, you know, a little bit more personal or whatnot, and you've already heard these stories. But I can imagine that this is a, a the many casual that, fan like these these in these stories. But for like Giants yeah, fans, no, like I didn't learn nothing new. No, but I mean, I was even going to say, even for like the most, uh, you know, diehard Giants fan, I can imagine that this is the first interview where they have listened to Joe Judge because it's a Sean McVay, you know, Sh- Peter Schrager podcast, and it's a big podcast, not just you know, smaller show that maybe judge went on. I can imagine that this is like the first time that a lot of fans got to kind of hear these stories and especially, you know, hearing how judge went to a D three school and, you know, then went to Alabama and some stories about how, you know, Saban and Belichick, you know, challenged them. I even like the one story where it was, you know, they were talking about like his clothes, the coaches were talking about his clothes and he was talking about how, you know, you, you can't, you have to basically kind of just take it and laugh with it. So you don't want to, you know, you know, freak out. And, you know, that was, that was a le- you know, learning moment. Just take the, you know, bullshit, whatever. So yeah. Uh, cool. I, I thought it was cool. Uh, you know, not nothing crazy, but I can imagine just, it, it's, it's one of those things, Bobby, you know, and we, we have this too, when we, if we interview a player, let's just say, you know, and it's not the most exciting, it's more or less just exciting to hear the coach talk kind of like in a personal environment. And, you know, that person talk in the personal environment rather than like, Oh, it was a really awesome interview, which I find sometimes that's that's what you got to do. So, yeah, yeah. So, but you know what? That just means when Joe Judge comes on with us, uh, it will just it'll, we will have the best Joe Judge interview because like we're, go. we're gonna we're gonna really pull and, and tug at all the good stuff. There you go. Well, speaking of um, pulling and tugging, and, and they like the, every interview he goes on now, they try and get a. This is getting a little. Every interview he's been on is like the Eagles week 17. Like they saw that great sound bite he gave. And it's like, all right, every time we talk to him, we're going to try and get like, yeah. get that. And he answered that with like a, like a one word answer. He's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. He's never going to live that down. That's probably like a regret that he has low, low key. Like he should have never said that. His players loved it. So I don't, I think, you know, he gets a little, like he gets some crap about that from the national media, but his players love, like, I know they love that. And I the fans love too. that too. And that's really what matters. It. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, like we, I mean, we love that 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 quote. Like that was that was big, and you know, all the ESPN big heads were like, "This guy, he the, he's too serious." Um, the players love him, anyways. Hey, Bobby interview. Skinner. Hey, Bobby Skinner. <laughs> oh crap! First. Go ahead. Go I'm gonna ahead. read something first. Guess what? DraftKings Sportsbook. It's not only my favorite sports book, but it's America's top rated sports book. They sent our company. John Boy Media out for the All Star Game, which is kind of awesome. They had a really, really good time. We love DraftKings Sportsbook. It's easy to navigate. I didn't get Has, invited. You, nope, we didn't get invited. I mean, they had a really good time. So, little, little bit of FOMO, especially home run derby, seemed like a blast. Um, we loved using DraftKings Sportsbook. Easy to navigate. Plenty of instructions for new betters and nearly limitless ways to get in on all the action. My friends and family, they've been loving, they've been loving using DraftKings Sportsbook, and I know you'll love it too. Listen to this great offer. DraftKings Sportsbook is putting you courtside with a chance to turn $1 and $150 in site credits. That's right. Pick either basketball team. And if that team is still in contention, Suns and the uh, Bucks, bet $1. And if that team wins, you win $150 in site credits. Don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook offers great odds and promotions on basketball and so much more all week long. Well, I, get, well, I, I said basketball. I meant say baseball. Offers on other sports like baseball so much more week, all week long. DraftKings Sportsbook gets safe, secure, reliable. So you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code JOHNBOY when you sign up to turn $1 into $150 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice to win their next game. And if they do, you will claim $150 in free credits. That's promo code JOHNBOY for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years older. New Jersey, Indiana, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or an Indiana 1-800-9 with it. All right, we have JT Alphabet of the pinnacle Atlanta. He's a trainer. Like I, like I said at the beginning of the pod, trains Evan Ingram, Darius Slayton, Andrew Thomas Aziz, Ojalar, and Tay Crowder. Um, I would say take less about like he's like these guys are all going to like every one of them is going to be great and that's what he should do if he's but more just about like what they're working on and, and relationships and stuff like that so here is jt alphabet all right we now welcome onto the program he's a trainer out of base out of atlanta uh runs the pinnacle atlanta jt alphabet jt one Yo. first of all thanks for coming on two before we get into it because obviously we want to talk about you had like you know 
25 percent of the giants roster down there training with you uh what is pinnacle and how did it start okay well um pinnacle you know it's been around for like uh, maybe six to seven years at, at first it was just a baseball facility and um once i graduated college i started interning there and i was training baseball guys but for my background i'm a football and, and track guy so you know we decided to venture out and and I think that's it's going pretty well for us right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be. Is it is it like just pro athletes or like you know, uh, we talk so, with Daniel Jones trainer and it's like I just throw with overhand throwers and that's it. Like no, oh, yeah, yeah. So we have um, all ages. Uh, our probably um, uh, youngest is a ten year old kid maybe, um, but we have all ages from kids, um, amateurs, high school, college, and pro. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Last year, last year we talked with Keenan Forney, who you know was training with Andrew, mm -hmm. um, and played in the NFL and stuff. So I always like seeing that it's like the training facilities where it's like, hey, these guys are good enough to be training the pros, yeah. But they're also with the youth and stuff, which is yeah, exactly, which is, which exactly. is pretty cool to see. So we uh, we know you know I guess I told you before we we try to not post people's training clips because you know every single player has them, but I saw you had Aziz Ojolari, Andrew Thomas, Tay Crowder the Georgia guys, and then later saw uh, Evan Ingram was there. How did you get hooked up with the these four New York Giants, or was it one, and then the rest came later? Um, so, well, I was training Evan. Um, Evan has been my guy since uh, March 1st. Um, I actually grew up with Evan. We played football against each other, and we just always had a respect for each other. Uh, um, once he saw that I was training, he, you know, he gave me a chance, and he liked what I was doing, and so – um, this offseason, we went, you know, head on with it. Um, now, the other guys, uh, like uh, Z's, um, I was training Z's little brother, who uh, actually is at LSU, uh, BJ Ojolari. And so BJ told Z's about it, and Z's came in, tried it out, and he's been stuck with me since. Um, uh, then I got Tay Crowder, and then Andrew came, and um, I actually had Slade today. So it's just been growing, yeah. Oh, so Slayton, I know Slayton's in Georgia too, too. Yeah. So that, yeah. that makes sense. They pulled um, up today. Well, it seems like they must like you because it's, it's spreading <laughs> a, a good word of mouth spreading. Uh, yeah, man, it's roster. crazy. It's going crazy right now. Um, especially those Georgia, I mean, the Giants, they've drafted like five in the last four years. Dog Nation. Have, have they, <laughs> what, what Giant is, or what Georgia dog is going to end up on the Giants in 2022? We've already like, I don't early. know, man. You got George know. Pickens. You got a couple of guys <laughs> that you like in there. Yeah, I don't know, man. We'll see. Um, so let's get into the players. Um, and we'll start off with Aziz because he is the newest member. He's a rookie, second yeah. round pick who had first round buzz. What is something that you've like that he's identified and you guys are working on that it's like, okay, like you need this to go on the end, mm -hmm. like in that next level? Well, um, Z's, man, that dude, he shouldn't be that big and you know, move that well uh, he's so he's so strong he's explosive um, but the one thing that we're working on right now is just body control learning how to control his body um, learning how to move through all different planes um, so that's something big that we're working on once he get that I think he's going to take off he's going to be the next one right on um, with Andrew like so like okay what what do you exactly are you working on with these guys because you know obviously you know, you know, are you like like working on football movement, whether or you know preventing so, injuries or, or or what? Yeah. So everything is basically um, learning how to move in different planes, learning how to control their body. We we rarely lift heavy weight. Um, we 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 choose to do movements over maxes, basically functional movements over maxes. So anything we do is performance based. Anything we're going to do is something you're going to do on the field. We don't squat heavy. We don't bench heavy. It's just controlling the body, man. And my partner, my partner, Coy Flynn, uh, that's the strength coach. He's really creative. And we, we tend to put the speed and the lift together anytime we program. So first day would be a linear day. The lift is something that's going to be a linear as, as well. Change of direction will be the next day. It's going to have some change of direction in the lift acceleration it will be the next day it's going to be a combo of everything so anything we do basically we put it all together so i i think that's why the guys are, are, are loving it you know so andrew you mentioned you know not lifting heavy which which i like andrew he's coming <laughs> off that he's coming off that ankle injury 
Yeah. How does he look? Because last time we got to see him was in the in the OTAs, and he looked fine, but um, you know they weren't working him the full load, and no, we were already sure. like, is is he like full on ready to go right now? That dude is ready. Um, that dude is a freaky athlete. Um, he 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 moves just as well as the other guys. He's just weighs way more, but. That dude is ready, man. Uh, I think year two is going to be a breakout year for him. I have, I, I mean, I know Giants fans are worried about the ankle, but I'm here to tell you, like, he's ready to go. So, yeah. It was, it re- I, I was big on, you know, I try to do, like, you know, the scouting stuff. Obviously not a, a scout, yeah. but, you, but you look at the stuff, and I always kind of had Andrew above all those other guys in his class, and, you know, Beckton and Will. His, his rookie year in New York sucks because <laughs> it's, it's, it's brutal. Because he, you know, and he he admitted, you know, he started out fans, slow, crazy. but yeah. he at the end of the year, it's like okay, like he's here, he's ready. Yeah, um, excited to see him build. And like you said, man, like that's why I liked him the most. It's like just that raw athleticism. Like man, if he I'm telling you, forty times. Athlete, like look man. at his twenty yard shuttle, the fastest shuttle in the whole combine. There's something wrong with you if you worry about a forty for a left tackle. There's something wrong with you. Twenty yard something. shuttle is is what is what it is. And he had, yeah, I think he had the second fastest out of offensive linemen. Yeah. Um, which he, like you said, he has that athletic ability. That dude's um, What about Tay? What what is what is Tay working on? How's he feeling? Um, well, I, obviously, came you know switched from running back to linebacker. Yeah, and then was you know the last pick of the draft, and then got thrown in in the first five weeks. Yeah. Well, I actually had Tay for like a few days. I think he's up there in New York right now, so he wanted to get a head start before everybody got there. Um, that dude is a worker. Like he grinds, and that's why I love him. Anything. Um, that needs to be done, he's going to get it done. Um, he looks like a running back, but he also looks like a linebacker. So they're going to have trouble dealing with him on this defense this year, man. I'm excited for him, man. I was yeah. pushing for him to get in there and, and early, and then when he came – when he showed – I mean, I have to get like 10 tackles in his first a, game. He, he has a chip on his shoulder. Um, that 255, he has a chip on his shoulder. He he embraces it, and I love that he embraces it. Yeah, I know. I think I think they even did like a whole like his town. They gave him a sign that said Mr. Irrelevant. So, yeah, he, you could definitely tell he's leaning into it. I know he did his camp and stuff in the offseason. So it seems like he is putting in that work. How how about Andrew versus Z's? Obviously, you're not doing full on battles yeah. or nothing. But <laughs> how, how are those two together? They were together yeah. when Aziz got drafted. Are they like are they chirping hey. at each other about, you know, those one on ones in camp? They, they talk about it all the time. They talk about the Georgia days, and they talk about it up there right now. Um, those dudes, man, they, they're hilarious. They, they love to compete no matter what we do, and I, I love it. I have them working out together, so we're competing all day, every day. Who, did, did you get any inside info on who won the one-on-ones at Georgia, <laughs> or, or do both tell you that they oh, won? Oh, man, I'm going to say it was a tie. I'll say it was a tie. I'll say uh. it was a tie. I've tried I my hardest to try and to get like just give me ten practice reps of those two together. <laughs> I haven't yeah, been able I to can't find give you that. I can't give you that. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned you know Evan was the first person you talked to. Yeah. How is he feeling mentally? Because he had, I mean, you know, he had a year where those drop like he yeah. like he full year healthy, which I think was the first time in his, his career. I know he had one year; he only missed one game. Yep. But you know, he had those drops, and he you know came out and talked about it. How is he mentally one going into a contract year, but in a year where, you know, we talked about New York fans, they are low on him because yeah. of those drops. How does he feel mentally going into this year? Mentally, he's ready, man. He 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 looks ready. Um, I know he's ready. We we put in a lot of work since March. Um, he's in the best shape of his life. He's moving well. He's consistently touching 22 miles an hour at 240. Um, we do a speed session. We do our lift session. And after every day, we catch at least 100 balls before we go and I, I love that he get he's getting the extra eats every day that's what I like to call it um catch 100 balls then he goes out trains with his receiver trainer and that's his day I mean he he's ready to go man so I hope I just hope you guys are ready this is this is about to be a show I think it's going to be a crazy show with him is there anything he's like working like I mean, he, he, I think he led the NFL in drops and like, you see the athletic ability and, and there's a reason why, you know, he has that game breaking speed and just, he makes big plays, but yeah. he was inconsistent this past year. Is there any like a different approach he's cha- taking to that? Because I mean, it's really is like the loudest thing right now with him yeah. is that because, yeah, know. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of hand eye work. Um, so that's a lot of stuff. That's, that's the most important thing that we focused on hand eye um and getting an extra eats every day we catch at least 100 balls before we go um so 
that hand eye is going to work out great for him, I think. Does he ever talk about how much Giants fans are annoying with him? Because he made the Pro Bowl, and I, I felt bad for him because, you know, uh, I was like, man, he, he didn't make the Pro Bowl. Like, he didn't choose that, and people were coming uh, out. I don't, I don't really think he buys into it. I don't really think he focuses on that. He doesn't even, like, like care about them, to be honest. Um, they love him. They love him. If they hate him, they hate him. He's moving on. I mean, it's time to go. You know, it's a big year coming for him. Yeah, I mean, and he and he knows if it comes out and does what he's capable of doing this year, it'll 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 turn that quickly. And yeah, I mean, it, I we saw with Andrew, people were losing their mind on Andrew, and by week yeah, eleven, we, we had him yeah. back on. Like, okay, here, we, this is yeah. why we drafted him. Kind of I think I think those fans are gonna love him this year. I, I, I sure think so. Yeah. Well, I hope so, man. JT, where can people find if they, you know, we have listeners. Which, yeah. by, you know, I, I'm not meaning to brag, by the way. I, I'm down here in Florida, and I found, like, you know, a handful of listeners from the exact county. So I know yeah. we got some people in Atlanta and probably some young football players. Where can they, like, get in touch with you and Pinnacle? Okay, so my Instagram is uh, at JT Alphabet. Um, my Twitter is at JT Alphabet underscore. Um, at the Pinnacle ATL, that's the facility if you want to check it out. Um, but, yeah, that's my social. That's everything you need to know. Just hit me. JT, thank you for giving us uh, some time of your day. And so, hopefully, hopefully we're talking next offseason about how all these guys came and had a good year. Hey, man, y'all going to see, man. Trust me. Y'all going to see. Appreciate it. All right, bro. Appreciate it. Look, that one's perfect. Even the best baseball players strike out with bases loaded. The best golfers sometimes three-putt with the tournament on the line. And I hate baseball and golf. So if you feel like you come up short in the bedroom sometimes, it's perfectly okay. But if it's bothering you, there are options. Go to GetRoman.com slash world. Now, get your man. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all, for the com- all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find your best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, it ships you free with two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Getting started simple. Just go to GetRoman.com, GetRoman.com slash world. And complete an online visit. Take care of your ED without leaving home. Complete an online visit today to connect with a doctor and take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash world and now to get $15 off your first month. Look, there's a straightforward way to take care of your ED. GetRoman.com slash world. I've read that. I've, I mean, I've read that like 20 times. You just get your ED stuff. Get started now to save $15 in your first month of treatment. Bam. Snack, snacks is going to use it. He, he let me know. Danny's using it and he says it works great, so. Doctors are nice, non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. Like I'll judge you, but those doctors yeah, won't. Bobby will judge you. Um, so don't don't tell us if you use the promo code. <laughs> no, I won't judge you for the for using that. Just on like your life in general. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I judge Justin all the time. You he does he does it on the show. Um, hey Justin, this else? is what I this is what I don't like about you. Say it on the show. Think of um, think of one thing right now. What? Think of, one thing you on? you don't, think of one thing you don't like about me right now. Um, do you want like something playful or something serious? Oh, whatever, whatever route you want to go down. Um, I think you think things should be the way they ought to be and not the way they are in reality. But That's we deep. should get this. It's like, okay, but we like, we don't. So let's deal with it. And, like i don't think you embrace the struggle as much as me like i i kind of enjoy struggling and you're just like no screw that like i want you don't know to, me you don't i want know things me. to go right i want things to go right well i mean wa- wa- wanting things to go right i don't think that's a battle is that the critique it's deeper than that but we don't have enough time for that um anything else before we close out the pod um Kadarius Tony loves us. Um, yes, I, that's true. He's a talking giants commenter. He's a commenter on our Instagram posts. I, I made a meme of, um, of, you know, the, the boyfriend that looks back at, you know, he's holding a girl's hand of the, you know, he has a girlfriend on his right side, but he's looking, whew, yeah, he's we looking know back. Meme. Um, you know that meme? So I, I made the meme and I said, um, still obsessing over young Joker's song. And then the girlfriend on the right, that's like, how dare you ignore me? It, and it said, saquon barkley's new workout pictures which so transition um i love the take that everybody's having just because saquon barkley is putting out workout pictures and his legs look 
really good in them, I should say. Yeah, I'm just not phased by that anymore. Like we've we've seen like they've been like that. Like it was like now it's like okay, that's just take one. But we have those pictures that come out, and it's not even a video. They were pictures. Uh, people are com- people are therefore forming the take based off of pictures saying comeback season for Saquon. So it is I a love- comeback season. He'll be eased back, which <laughs> is a fact, by the way, because we we were kind of getting a little heat for using that. Yeah, I got pretty on pretty good authority that they're actually easing him back. Oh, I don't know what that means. I don't I don't think that means he's missing week one, but they are going to ease him back. Little little bit of a talking Giants report. Never tweeted out. Of course not. Out. Not tweet. Yeah, you got to listen to. You have to be listening at the fifty-four minute mark to get this type of information. Boom. Um. So that should I talk about the whole Dwayne Haskins thing? No. Why not? I don't feel like it. I gotta. I gotta go record another interview. We can. Too many people got so mad about that. It was a joke. That you put a picture of a hole. In Dwayne Haskins' smiling face. Yeah, I tried to like he's wife, missing a tooth because you know the his wife report was he. Yeah, that's. Funny. I would that's, let my I would funny. let my wife punch me all the time. That's funny. If I had a wife, I'd let her punch me in the face all the time. <laughs> well, if that's what you're into. That's, yeah. Um, hey, I just people were just like mad. I don't know. It was like almost like they wanted to be able to like hit women. They're like the double standard. It's like yeah, we know. Like obviously, it's different. Um, and people are like, there's nothing funny about this. Like, yes, there is. There's stuff is funny. Okay, like it, it's okay to make jokes. You know, it wouldn't be funny. No, I'm not gonna go there. No, I, it wouldn't be funny. It's funny because it's Dwayne Haskins. Yeah, and I I felt obligated to do it because of Dwayne Haskins. But at the same time, if that happened to you, I would laugh at you. Wow. And I would make you. I would make the same exact jokes. Wow. Harsh. I mean, but it's just like, that's just like, that's what like being fun, trying to be funny is about. Twitter sucks. Um, Don't get get punched by your wife. Unless that's your thing. Yeah. It ain't illegal to dodge. Don't hit back. Now don't definitely don't do that, but it ain't illegal to dodge. Dip, duck, dip, dive, dodge, dip, duck. How's that go? I don't know, but just don't like, you know, whatever. Um, Whatever. They made me delete the tweet. I didn't want to. All right, that's a show. We appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Tuesday. Not even sure what we're going to do on Tuesday. Mailbag. Like we, maybe, but we might have an interview too. We, we there'll be an, there'll be a mailbag sometime next week. We're trying to get a couple interviews, maybe. Um, and then after that is training camp. PPP starts. So we appreciate you guys. We will see you then. Enjoy your weekend. Until then, let's go big blue.